Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. All right, we're continuing on with our identity series. We've been talking about what it means to be created in the image of God, that God created us different than everything else that's created. And, and part of that uh, difference that He created us is to have a relationship with Him. I was thinking about this in that second song. It talked about how uh, the veil was torn. And if, you, if you've not been a lot in church a lot, you may not know what that talks about. But before Jesus, there was a separation between man and God. Sin had separated us. And even when they worshipped God in the temple, only the high priest could go back in the presence of God once a year, and it was behind the veil. So when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was torn from the top down. Uh, And that's symbolic. It actually happened, but it's symbolic of God opening up this relationship that we have with Him through Jesus Christ. And we talked about this on Easter. This idea of our identity was the primary, one of the primary functions, if not the primary function of a Christian, is to live a life of prayer. We talked about how, as a, uh, even if you're an atheist, you can do good things for the poor. You can help serve people. You can meet the needs of those around you. But what separates Christians from uh, other people is that we have a connection to God, is that we can pray to God. So we talked about this, that you can do a lot of things in the church and not even have a relationship with God. You can serve in helping hands. You can go on a mission trip. You can go to, to, to Green Hills, to the, to the school up there. You can serve in Awana. You can do all kinds of things in the church and not have a relationship with God. And we talked about on Easter that that's the most important part. The most important part is the relationship that we have with God, not not the service part. Now, we should serve. That should come out of our life and our relationship with Him. But primarily, we need to to be in prayer with Him and, and let Him lead and guide us and let's have a conversation with Him. And we talked about how this idea of prayer does several things for us. We, we talked about how uh, in John chapter 15, how Jesus talks about as Christians, we must abide with Christ. What does that mean? He used this idea of a vine and a branch that are connected. That, that idea is a relationship, that we get life from being connected to Him. We talked about on Easter how the, the Christian life and becoming a Christian is not just about life after death it's that we get life now and part of that is this relationship that we have in him and that's accomplished through prayer we talked about how in Romans chapter 12 1 and 2 it says offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God this is your spiritual act of worship and we talked about this dichotomy that exists to live living sacrifice to live and to die how do we do that we do that through prayer we pray and we say God, these are, these, these are the things that are on my list. These are the things that I'm thinking about. These are the things that stress me out. But however, not my will, God, but yours. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This idea that even as we pray, we're laying our life down so that God will lead us. So prayer is the essential part of that. And then we begin to look at Nehemiah last week. And we looked at uh, how Nehemiah... He, he got this news from home. Nehemiah had a pretty easy life. He was cupbearer to the king, which meant he ate the king's food to make sure nobody poisoned him. And if people liked the king, it was a pretty cush job. He got paid to eat. I mean, who wouldn't want that deal? And that's what he did. I mean, life was easy for him. Yes, he was in a foreign country. It was a foreign land, but he had an easy job. But he, he heard this news about his hometown Jerusalem, and it had been torn down. It was in shambles. It, it said it was even in disgrace. And, and it broke Nehemiah's heart. And, and what we looked at is, is that part of what Nehemiah did is he began to pray. It broke his heart so much that he prayed. And, and we talked about last week how this, when, when God captures our heart with something, part of what we do is, is God has given us a race to run. That was the idea last week. And I don't know what your race is, and your race may look different than somebody's race over here. And, and what that looks like is, is that God will burden your heart with things that he may burden somebody else's heart with something else. 
And for Nehemiah, his heart was burdened to rebuild his home city. So what I encouraged you to do last week is to to begin to open your eyes around in the community and see what it is that captures your heart. Maybe it's teenagers. Maybe it's single mothers. Maybe it's the needy. Maybe it's the homeless. Whatever it is that captures your heart, begin to pray about those things just like Nehemiah did. So I encourage us to open our eyes. And and here's what we learned is that, that Nehemiah saw a need. There was a need that broke his heart. And, and, and here's what we're going to see. And I want us to follow along with Nehemiah. We're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 2 today. And with him, we're going to see some things that may actually get in the way of us running our race. So I want us to look at that. And then I want to challenge us here by the end of the day. All right. So we finished in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 8. So let's pick it up in verse 9. It said, I went to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates and I gave them the king's letters. The king uh, had also sent letters to the infantry and cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Heronite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard that someone had come to pursue the, pro- uh, the prosperity of the Israelites, they were greatly displeased. So here's the first thing we see. We see Nehemiah. He got this news about Jerusalem. It broke his heart. He prayed for months. And finally he got up the nerve to go ask the king, not just his boss, the king, The most powerful guy in the land. Hey, can I have like a year or two off? Imagine going to your boss and asking for a year off. Like he went to the king and asked for time off. To go back and rebuild a city that, by the way, the king had already said, don't rebuild. So he's he's actually going against the king's own orders. And, and he prays and he approaches the king, he, ta- he shoots his shot, he takes the risk, and the king's like, sure, whatever you want, I'll help you with. He even gives him letters and a couple of military guys to go with him. So here's what happens, right? And I want to caution you in this, is that God may break your heart for something, and the very first thing that you may run into is opposition. And that's exactly what Nehemiah ran into. These guys were displeased that Nehemiah was going to rebuild the city. And, and I want you to think about this. You may run into this. There are people who will say, well, you, you can't do that. That's impossible. There, there, there are people who have a negative mindset who are going to be negative about no matter what you try to do. And, and you will run into opposition. And, and here's what we need to understand when we do this. Is that sometimes we get to this point and we get fired up and God burdens our heart and we run into opposition. And then all of a sudden we just stop. And, and we have this idea that, that God's will is like an open door. And, and I want to caution you against that. And here's what I mean by that. Sometimes we say, well, if it's God's will, he'll open the door for me. And, and we expect to, to like pray for something and this is God's will and then all of a sudden this path will open up and it will be lighted and there'll be music and it's like, ha ah. ha. And there'll be people on the sideline cheering like, yeah, this is it. You got, you got it. But that's nowhere in the Bible. The truth of the matter is, is that if you do anything for God, you will face opposition. As a matter of fact, if you don't face opposition, you may not be on the right path. Because here's the thing about what we do for God is, there is forces that want to work against us. Look, Think about all throughout the Bible, all the things and all the people that God called. There, there were hard times. We looked at a lot of those examples last week. And, and, and we, we think about this. Think about uh, when, when Jesus had an encounter with Paul on, on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9. God sent, or Jesus sent Ananias to Paul and he said, I want you to go to Paul and I want you to tell him how much he's going to suffer for my name. You know what that is? That's a roadblock. That's a hard time. We would call that, well, that's a closed door. I'm out. Think about Peter. We talked about Peter last week. Peter, he denied Jesus three times. He went back to fishing. He was just doing his thing. And he had this encounter with Jesus. And Jesus said, do you love me? He said it three times. And then he said, Peter, you used to go wherever you wanted to go. You used to tie your own belt. You used to do whatever. But there's going to be people who are going to tie you up and they're going to kill you. Follow me. How's that for that lighted heavenly path that we're supposed to walk down? So I want to challenge you on this idea of 
God opening these doors and that that is somehow God's will. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes we have to kick through those things. There will be opposition uh, for anything that we do for God. Think about the church in Acts. We went through the book of Acts about a year and a half ago. Everywhere the, the new church turned, they ran into opposition. So I want to encourage you, if you do anything for God, you will face opposition. But I want us to push through. We're going to see that example here for uh, Nehemiah. So let's, let's go back a minute to Nehemiah. And let's, let's look at when he approached the king. The king asked him, hey, what is it that you want? So Nehemiah summarizes his whole mission in, in these verses. So let's go back to Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 3. So Nehemiah approaches the king. He was sick. And the king asked him why he was sick. He wasn't feeling good. He didn't look good. His heart was broken. This is his response. It says, He replied to the king, May the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king asked me, What is your request? So here we go. He's going to sum it all up right here. He says, So I prayed to the God of the heavens and answered the king, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor with you, send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are burned, so that I may rebuild it. One man. At this point, Nehemiah is all alone. He says, if nobody else will do it, I'll do it. And here's what I want us to understand. One person with a vision compelled by God can change the world. And this is what Nehemiah faces. Thinking about, think about going back and rebuilding a city. And he's not even in the city. He just heard about it and wants to go back and says, I'll do it. And, and, and we, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago that sometimes you can be interested in something or committed to it. Interested is you do it when it's convenient to you. Committed is you do it no matter what. At this point, we see that Nehemiah is committed. He's not just interested in building back the city. He's committed to it. He risked his life and his job to go do this. So he's going to overcome these great obstacles. He's got the, the very first thing he does is he faces opposition. He's got guys who are saying, well, you can't do that. You, you're wasting your time. You, we're not happy that you're doing this. So he faces this opposition. So what do we do? Well, I want you to think about the Bible for a minute. And I want you to think about the New Testament. When we look at the people that God used, it's people that you really don't think of a lot of times. We think about, uh, think about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious guys of the day. They were rule followers. They were good at following the rules. They were good at telling you that you weren't following the rules. They were civil for the most part, although they did try to kill Jesus. They actually did kill Jesus. But for the most part, they were just... Civil people that people looked up to. But then look at who Jesus called. And look at who he used to change the world. He called some fishermen, some tax collectors, and some sinners. And it was guys like that who were willing to push through. See, you think about those religious guys. You know what they were really interested in? What everybody else thought. If you go back and you read the New Testament, they were more concerned with what other people thought. But the guys who God used to change the world are guys who didn't think that way. They didn't care what everybody else thought. And, and, and that's exactly who Nehemiah is. He's a guy just like that. Think about what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. He says, look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Beware of them because they will hand you over to local courts and flog you. In their synagogues. Does that sound like an open door? Well, God opened the door and we just walked right in. It was just easy. It doesn't work that way. And it never has. So listen, I want us to understand that when we do something for God, it's going to be hard. So when we face these obstacles, what's next? Well, what does Nehemiah do? Well, let's, let's go back down to, to Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 13. So he faces this opposition. These guys were displeased with him. Look at what happens in verse 13. So it says, I went out at night through the valley gate toward the serpent's well and the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. 
I went on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, uh, but further down I became, it became too narrow for my animal to go through. So I went up by night by way of the valley and inspected the wall, then headed back, and I entered through the valley gate, and I returned. Uh, it says, um, it said, heading back, I returned to the valley gate and returned. The officials did not know where I had gone for, or what I was doing, for I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest of those uh, who would be doing the work. So here's what we see. Nehemiah understood that it was not going to be just him who's going to be rebuilding these walls. He, he knows who's going to help him. He just hasn't gotten them involved yet. But let's back up a little bit. Let's back up to verse 11. So he faces this uh, opposition and he goes back to Jerusalem. It says, after I arrived, I'd been there three days. I got up at night and took a few men with me. I didn't tell anyone what my God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem. Uh, the only animal I took was the one I was riding. So here's what Nehemiah did when he faced opposition. He found a few good men. He began to build a team. He began to share his vision with other people because when we face something alone, it seems daunting. So Nehemiah knew the task ahead of him was daunting. He knew he couldn't do it on his own. And quite honestly, when you begin to look out in your community and you begin to see these things that God lays on your heart, you're going to say, there's no way that I can do that on my own. Well, that may be exactly what God's calling you to do is to try to build an army, to try to get a few good men, to try to motivate other people because we're going to see something here in a minute with Nehemiah that although this task that he's been called to is great, and he was all alone at one point, he begins to build a group of people with this shared vision. So he shares this vision with these guys, and these guys help him survey the wall. Then we jump back down to verse uh, 16, and he, he has these Jews and priests and nobles and officials and the rest of those who would be doing the work. Look at verse 17. It says, So I said to them, You see the trouble we're in? This is how a vision starts. It starts with pointing out what the trouble is. There's, there's something for us to do. And, and when you begin to look throughout your community and you begin to see things, it's probably going to be a problem is what's going to capture your heart. And I don't know what that is for you. But it's going to break your heart. It's going to capture your heart. And it's going to give you this vision. And sometimes you may not even know what the solution is. But we continue to pray. And we begin to build this team. And we begin to see what happens. And, and this is what happens. He says, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. And its gates have been burned. Come, let's rebuild Jerusalem's wall. So that we will no longer be a disgrace. I told him how the gracious hand of my God had been on me. And what the king had said to me. They said, let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to do the good work. So this is interesting. This shared vision, these guys were ready to go. And here's what we learn. Sometimes there's a raging fire that just needs a spark. And that's exactly what Nehemiah runs into right here. Everybody wanted to see Jerusalem rebuilt. All the Jews. They just needed somebody to start it off. And I'll bet you... Whatever it is that captures your heart, it's captured other people's hearts as well. And you may be the spark that leads to doing something great. So I want to encourage you to do that. I want you to encourage you to share your vision of what God has laid on your heart. That, that there's this spark that you may start that may spread like crazy to be able to do crazy things. But then look what happens. It begins to build. Now the people are motivated. And it, it said at the end of that verse, it says, it strengthened their hands to do work. I, I want to focus on that for just a moment. We talked about Easter, how we should pray. We talked about how the, uh, the Sunday after Easter, we should run our race. And we have to put those two together because here's what that means. We've talked about this for years, that God uses people to accomplish his will. Does God want to see Jerusalem rebuilt? Absolutely he does. But who's he going to use? He's going to use somebody. He's going to use people. And there's things that God wants to accomplish here in our schools, in our homes. And he's wanting to use people to do it. So this is the idea. This is what this looks like. And it's really pretty simple. We're going to pray. And God's going to give us a vision of what to do. And then we have to do something. It's literally throughout the Bible. 
is God gives people a vision of something to do and then somebody has to do it. I got news for you. Here in Lenore City, that's us. It's us. Who's he looking to do something through? It's us. So we're going to pray and then we're going to do something. James talks about how faith without works is dead. And this is the idea. Faith is prayer. When we pray, we're praying in faith that God will do something. Works is, okay, we've prayed God's going to do something. Now he's going to use us to do it, so let's get to work. So these two things go hand in hand. We're going to become a church that prays, and then we're going to do something. We're going to run our race. We're going to do what he's called us to do. So here's our challenge. This has been... Something that God's laid on my heart. I've shared this with you uh, several times. But for us as a church, you know what I think our greatest need is in our community? It's for men to rise up. That's what God has laid on my heart. It's that it's time for men to rise up and lead. Women have been leading. In churches especially. But it's time for men to rise up. That's the bottom line. And when I think about this vision that we want to share, there's a need in our community. And what, is it, what does it look like to lead? We're looking at this book in, in Nehemiah, and it's really, a lot of it is about God using somebody to do something great. And he's using a man uh, to do something. And he builds a, he builds a team, and, and it changes the community. And we get this idea of lead. What does leadership look like? Well, leadership, first and foremost, means the, you lead the people with you. So men, what does that look like for you? You're to lead your family. You're to lead at your job. You're to lead in your community. We're called to rise up and be leaders. Second of all, what what, what does a leader do? A leader looks ahead. They plan ahead. They look for danger. They look for opportunities. They plan ahead. They, They have their own vision. You should have your own vision for your own family on what you want. Yeah, what you want that to be like. You should have a vision for your job and how God can use your job for the kingdom. You should have a vision for, okay, what does God want me to do in my community? Man, that's your job to set that for your family. That, that happens through prayer. Men, we should be people of prayer. That's where it starts. The, one of the third things that leaders do is they watch over people. They provide safety. They provide leadership and guidance. We look out for wolves who want to come in and we protect. It's part of what we do. I got news for you. The wolves are wanting to come in. The world is attacking our families and our communities. And men, it's time for us to stand up. Also, men, we are to provide. Men are to be producers, not consumers. We've talked about this. I think I did a whole sermon on this whole thing. That that men in today's world have become consumers. They consume pornography. They consume women. They consume whatever. But God has called us to be producers, not consumers. Consumers is saying, I want that for me. Producers saying, I'm going to do this for you. That's what leaders do. They provide for other people. That's what God has called us to do, men, is to be producers, not consumers. We show mercy. We show justice. And we never abandon the people that we're called to lead. That's what leaders do. Even when times are tough, we never abandon our people. So what does step one look like for us? Like if this is our vision, we want to do something, we want to see God do something in men, what does that look like? Well, I want us to think about Nehemiah. You think about Nehemiah and the task that lay before him. I'm going to rebuild these walls. I don't know who's on my team I don't even know if there's a team there. I hope there is. But what did Nehemiah do at first? When he heard about the news, he prayed for three months. Several months. I can't remember if it's three or four. I mean, he prayed. And, and he prayed and he asked God to do something in himself. And he asked God to do something in the king that he was about to approach. So here's what I want you to understand. Before Nehemiah could lead other people, he had to lead himself. So men, what is step one for us? Step one for us as leaders, is we have to lead ourselves. Now, this is true for women as well. Women lead, so I'm not, I don't want to exclude women. The, the, it starts, if all of us want to be leaders, we have to first and foremost be able to lead ourselves. If we can't lead ourselves, we certainly can't lead other people. So what does that look like? What I want us to do is I want, us, I want to lay down a challenge for us. Men and women both. This is what it means to lead ourselves. I want us to do four things. 
for the next 31 days. And this is what self-leadership looks like. Step number one, I want you to read one proverb a day. There's 31 proverbs. Read one proverb a day. Proverbs is about wisdom. It's about practical knowledge. Part of what it means to lead is to have wisdom. Wisdom is not just knowing something. Wisdom is knowing something and doing it. If you know something and don't do it, that's not wisdom. That's stupidity. So wisdom is knowing it and doing it. So we're going to, first and foremost, read one chapter of Proverbs a day. That's wisdom. Number two, we're going to read one psalm a day. What is psalms about? Most of the psalms were written by a guy named David who was a a leader. He was a man after God's own heart. And what you begin to do when you begin to read these psalms is you see prayers. You see praise and worship. You see a relationship that a man has with God. So wisdom and a relationship. Proverb a day, psalm a day. You can keep going after 31. You don't have to stop and say, well, the challenge is over. Keep going. There's like 150 of them. Cover you for probably the rest of the year. So keep going. Third thing I want you to do is I want you to pray. I want you to pray before you start. God, today I want you to give me wisdom today. And God, help me to apply it to my life. God, I want you to help me to to see a a man after God's own heart. I want you to help me to become a man after God's own heart. Then you're going to read. And then you're going to pray when you're done. God, this this is what you said to do. Psalm 1 is a great example. I'm going to read it here at the end. It says that we should should plant ourselves by living water. That we should know the word. We're going to read that in just a minute. God, help me to do that day in, day out. That's, That's our prayer after we're done. And and I want you to pray, God, what is it in my community that you want me to do? What is it that you're breaking my heart for? What is it that you want me to do with my life? So that's step three. So proverb a day, psalm a day, pray. And number four is this. I want you to write it down. I want you to have a sheet of notebook paper right there beside you. And I just want you to write down what God's telling you. And then after 31 days, let's see what happens. I bet God will show us something. I bet our relationship with God will be better. It's what it means to be close to Him, is to spend time with Him. We, it, it starts by leading ourselves. And, and maybe at the end of that 31 days, maybe God's given you an idea for a ministry. Uh, I'll, I'll use Tiffany Martin as an example. There's a thing in our church calendar about art. She's doing a thing for women. I can't remember the date. It's in the realm. You can look it up. But God, she wanted to be used by God with her talent, which is art, to reach people, to help women, to, to, to help you invite women to come do something. It, I don't know what your ministry is going to look like. I can assure you mine is not art or music or dancing. It's none of those things. But I don't know what yours is. But God can use whatever you have to reach people, to build relationships with people. And I want you to begin to write those things down. And then we're going to see what God does through that. We're calling this 31 days of wisdom, praise, and prayer. And at about the end of May, we're going to circle up and see what happens. And what I want to encourage you to do is, at the end of this time, if God's laid something on your heart, bring it to us. We'll figure out how to make it work one way or another. We'll turn it into a ministry. And God will begin to use you. And you begin to find purpose. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask Cameron to come up. He's uh, Cameron and Danielle. Y'all doing our invitation? I'm going to ask them to come up. Here's what I want us to do. Man, I'm done early today. I could go on. You mean go on? I know. I'm not going to go on. Here's what I want us to do. One of my favorite passages in all the Bible is Psalm chapter 1. If we would do just this, just the first three verses of Psalm chapter 1, it would change our life. It it ties in with Easter, it ties in with prayer, it ties in with our challenge today. So I just want to read these first three verses for you. It says, how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. So here's the idea. Your your translation may say how blessed or how happy is the man. 
And, and here's the idea. He's, he's talking about wisdom here, right? Where, where do we get wisdom from? That's the reason we're reading a proverb a day. He's saying some people get their wisdom from the wicked people, from mockers. So my question number one for us is if you're going to lead yourself, first you need to check and see who you're getting your advice from. Is it at the local bar? Where, where are you getting your advice from? It says, uh, how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. This is the idea of spending time in God's word and in Psalms and in Proverbs. To meditate on it, not just read it like we're reading a newspaper. This is God's word to us. We need to listen to what he says. We need to put it in our heart. We need to memorize it. And it says when we do that, verse 3, He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. And here's what the psalmist is saying. Listen, when we do this, it's like a tree planted beside a stream. You know what a tree needs to live? Water. And it's got streams, plural, all that it will ever need to have life. We talked about Easter. What does it mean to have life and have it now? It means to have a relationship with God through prayer and through His Word. And this is step one for us. This is what it means to lead ourselves. And when it does, it will transform us. So the foundation for all this starts right here for us as Christians. And listen, maybe you're here today and for you, you don't even have a relationship with God. Well, listen, that's where it starts with you. Is maybe today you need to say, listen, I I, I don't know about praying. I don't know about reading the Psalms. What I need is a relationship with God. And you get that through Jesus Christ. We talked about that veil being torn, that Jesus came to forgive you of your sins. He took those sins upon him so that you would have a relationship. Maybe today that's what you need. That's where it starts for you. But for us... Men and women, it's time for us to rise up. It's time for us to do our part. And that looks like prayer and doing something. So let's do it. Let's pray. God, we come to you today, God, just uh, challenged by Nehemiah and, and his heart that was broken for his hometown. God, for many of us, this is our hometown. For many of us, this is not our hometown. But it's the, it's the town that we live in. It's... It's the town that you've placed us in. And God, there are needs in this community that we need to open our eyes and see. And that, and that we begin to pray and you begin to mobilize, that you begin to use this church to, to have an impact on our community and those around us. And God, we just pray that over this 31 days that, that first of all, we lead ourselves, we spend time, we carve out time in our day to just spend time with you and listen to you and hear you and talk to you and let you talk to us back. And God, we write these things down and, and, and God, begin to stir up our hearts to do something for you and for your kingdom. God, help us to be a church that changes the world around us. And God, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's worship. Thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church. Please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel. Just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us. We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.